welcome everybody. I said it like twice already. I'm going to say it again. We really welcome you. Um, this is our final night of Hanukkah. And it's bittersweet, but made much sweeter by the amazing, amazing Ushpiz guest that we have welcomed for the night. Um, Sarah Bina Benor is with us tonight. And she is a wonderful, wonderful contributor to the flow of Judaism Unbound's podcast. One of the episodes that I get messages from listeners about like rend like frequently even though it came out a long time ago people really really love it um it is a pleasure to have you here sarah um sarah sarah Benor is a professor a scholar of jewish linguistics of jewish english um she is just an incredible leader in that field and has done work looking at everything from how Orthodox, how how newly Orthodox folks speak Hebrew and speak English, um, sorry, mostly speak English, um, how people in summer camp contexts utilize Hebrew in interesting ways, um, and a wide variety of topics in between. And tonight we have a pretty sensational linguistic discussion to open up, a, a hot controversial one to, to open up this time of year about Hanukkah. So, Sarah Bina Benor, it's great to have you. Thanks for being here. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. I am going to show some images, and I realize this is actually, this presentation is really not meant for a podcast. So I hope it's not going to be uh, broadcast in no. uh, with only the sound because they would miss out on all the images. Because this is really <laughs> video only. Yeah, this is really only, this is really a presentation about images uh, because it's about writing. It's about diversity in Jewish English writing. And um, I'm gonna start by asking the question, how should non-English words be written in Jewish English? And when I say non-English words, I mean mostly Hebrew words, but also some from other languages, especially Aramaic and Yiddish and some from Ladino. And the question of how they should be written includes the question of how they should be spelled, like the Hanukkah, Hanukkah, et cetera, question. But even before that question of spelling, there's a question of which alphabet should be used. <clears throat> and there are various combinations of the Hebrew and English alphabet that can be used in representations of Jewish English. You could write the Hebrew words in English letters or the Yiddish words in English letters. An example of this is this um, tag that I found at a Jewish summer camp. It says, join the women of Tsevet Ramah for a safe and spiritual morning of davening, Torah and learning, etc." And there's a bunch of Hebrew and some Yiddish words in here and they're all written in English letters. And that's probably the most common way that American Jews represent Hebrew and Yiddish words in Jewish English by using English letters. Another combination is English words in Hebrew letters. This is pretty rare, but it does happen in certain contexts. Here are some political examples. The kippah on the right says, Trump, Pence, keep America great. And it's all written in Hebrew letters. And to balance that out, the button on the left says, dump Trump. And these are all English words but they're written in Hebrew letters. And the third combination is writing that combines elements of multiple scripts. Here's an example from a shirt from the Bronfman Youth Fellowship. It says Bronfman Youth Fellows, but it combines a few letters from Hebrew within the primarily English letters. And here is an example of a face mask that says kapara, which is like a, a he slang Hebrew word for dear one. And you see that it's English letters, but the diacritics, the dots in the, in the C and the P and the, um, the vowel signs underneath are from Hebrew. So it's a combination of English and Hebrew alphabets. And you also see this with the faux Hebrew lettering where it's English letters, but they're designed to look a little bit like Hebrew letters. Now, what are the functions of these various combinations of scripts? Well, in my research, and I, I have a paper about this that's coming out in the Journal of Jewish Languages, which I edited. Um, it's coming out in just a week or two. And I found that there, were, there are four 
primary functions of script mixing. And I'm going to talk about each of them and explain these words that I'm using. So first, translanguaging. Translanguaging is a linguistic term that means using multiple languages simultaneously without necessarily de delineating between the languages. So some people will use one language in one context and another language in another context, but most people who are bilingual or have access to elements of multiple languages will mix them without regard to which language they're using at any given moment. And you see the use of Hebrew letters to represent English in contexts where bilinguals are writing. So here's a very interesting example. This is from a rabbi named Benjamin Safer or Safer, who uh, worked in a congregation in Jacksonville, Florida from 1902 to 1933. We have his letters, his writings from that time. And here he wrote out entire sermons. This was a 21 page handwritten sermon, all in English, all written in Hebrew letters using the um, writing conventions of Yiddish. So it says, the feast of tabernacles is called by the Hebrew, when, instead of when, it says when he recites his festival prayers, Zman, Zman Simchosenu, the season of gladness. Okay, so he's using the writing conventions of Yiddish because that's what he's used to. This represents his bilingualism. Now, usually, it's, it's not that common to have a full representation of English writing in Hebrew letters. More common is a representation of Ladino or Yiddish with some English words inserted. So this is an ad from a Ladino newspaper, and it is an ad for a renowned restaurant, a Sephardic restaurant. And you can see here three words that are in English, but written in Ladino orthography. It says Uptown, East, and Manager. You also see this with Yiddish. So here is a, an ad for Planters High Hat Peanut Oil, and the, word pe the words peanut oil are written in Hebrew letters, but it's not Yiddish, it's English. It's English written in Hebrew letters. Same with the sign on the left of your slide here. You have a Strictly Kosher Chicken Market, and all of those are written in Hebrew letters. And again, it is English words, not Yiddish words. But then underneath that, it says, frisch geschochten, frisch geschochten jeden, jede Stunde, freshly butchered every hour. And so any anyone who's walking by who knows any English or any Yiddish would be able to read this sign and determine what is sold in this market. And even if people don't know how to read, they can see from the beautiful pictures that they will be able to find poultry in this market. Here's a more contemporary version of this. This is a sign from the Catskills where there are a lot of Orthodox Jews, especially in the summertime. And it says Hamisha Bakery. It says that in English letters. It also says that in Yiddish writing, but it doesn't say it in Yiddish, or does it? What language is that? It could be, you could say it's Yiddish, Hamisha, but it, in Yiddish it would be Bekerai, but here it says Bekeri, and it is, um, so it really is translanguaging. It's representing the mixing of languages that happens in in ultra-Orthodox communities in America today, combinations of English, Hebrew, and Yiddish. You also see this in Jewish summer camp contexts. This is, these are some examples from Olin Sang Ruby Union Institute, a reform Jewish summer camp in Wisconsin. And they mix Hebrew and English. They incorporate words from both languages, like saying Ivrit, Hebrew, Ivrit. Clap. That is a, a, a thing that they do at that camp to highlight the, the Hebrew words. Um, but here on the right, you see some graffiti that a camper wrote where she indicated the divisions of the camp that she participated in. And notice she uses 
English letters for all of the divisions, except she adds a bet, the Hebrew letter bet for when she was there, second session. But in the final division, she writes it from left to right, in, I mean, right to left instead of left to right. And she writes it in Hebrew letters and actually in cursive letters, whereas previously she wrote it in print letters. So this indicates the changing under her changing understandings of the Hebrew and English script as she learned more Hebrew because that final division that says Chalutzim is a Hebrew immersion division. So this represents her translanguaging, her mixing of English and Hebrew, but it also has a symbolic representation showing the different her, her different understandings of the, the scripts of each language. So this brings me to the next function of script mixing, which is symbolism. Here we have an example of Hebrew letters representing English words that don't really represent translanguaging. It just says green team and Jewlicious. And why did they choose to use the Hebrew letters? Not because this is what the writers felt most comfortable with, but to highlight the Jewishness of these initiatives. The green team is an initiative of Temple Beth Am in Los Angeles that is, and you can see this, this logo represents the earth and the Jewishness with the Jewish stars and the Torah, et cetera. And the Hebrew letters, the word green team in Hebrew letters just highlights that combined combination of Hebrew, uh, of Jewishness and environmentalism. And with Julicious, you, you see the combination of the Jewishness of it in the name Jewlicious. It's, an, it's an, uh, like a Jewish outreach organization geared toward young adults in Los Angeles, um, but it also highlights it with the use of Hebrew letters. And of course, you get this with sports teams. Here you see Chicago White Sox, Chicago White Sox. And then here you see on the left, San Francisco Giants, go Giants. Now on the right, someone who sees this shirt wouldn't know that it was a Chicago White Sox logo probably um, by just looking at it because if they don't know Hebrew letters. But on the left, people would be able to understand that because it combines the script. But both of these, I would argue, use Hebrew script for symbolic purposes, not because people wouldn't be able to understand these if they were written in English letters. The audience here really is American Jews who have some understanding of the Hebrew script and can read those words. And you see, it's not just the names of the team, like giants, but sometimes other words like go in the case of this menorah. And of course, you get this at colleges as well. On the right, you have a mug that says Michigan. And on the left, it says it's high tide at Bama Hillel, roll tide. Uh, Alabama, University of Alabama, Roll Tide is their uh, logo, their, uh, you know, catchphrase, and you see it's written in Hebrew letters there. Now, they didn't have to write it in Hebrew letters, but the use of Hebrew letters symbolically highlights the Jewishness of this ca campus organization. And, of course, you get this in the political domain. I'm sure many people who are here have bumper stickers or buttons representing their favorite candidate in Hebrew letters. Um, I certainly do. And um, I also love these buttons. So on the right, you see a button that favors Al Gore in the 5761 election. And but the underneath Gore, it says Gore. And underneath George W. Bush, it says Gore Nisht which means not gore, but it also means nothing in Yiddish. And then on the left, you have a button that says Lobama McCain. So this was in the Obama McCain election. And instead of saying Obama, it says Lobama, meaning not Obama, and then McCain, Cain meaning yes. And so, so these are really Hamavin Yavin, those who understand, those in the know will understand. Um, they require some knowledge of read, not just reading the Hebrew letters, like if you just had an Obama bumper sticker in Hebrew letters, but really understanding the Hebrew words in the case of Lo and Cain, but those are words that elementary words that many American Jews would know, and 
um, understanding a little bit of Yiddish to be in on that joke. And you also get these in more serious contexts like Black Lives Matter. And interestingly here, they could have written Chayesh Chorim Chashuvim, which some other shirts do, or, um, but they chose instead to represent those English words in Hebrew letters. And that I argue serves a symbolic purpose. The one on the right would be not comprehensible to people who don't know any Hebrew. They might see the shirt and just think, oh, that person is wearing a Jewish youth group shirt or um, something from Israel. But the, the, the one on the left really does indicate that it, it, anyone who looks at that shirt would, would, be, um, would understand that that person supports the Black Lives Matter movement. And the one in the middle is similar to the one on the right in that even though it has the Hebrew acronym representing the English words, BLM, it still wouldn't be comprehensible to people who don't know those Hebrew letters. And then when we have faux Hebrew lettering, it also serves a symbolic purpose. In the case of the shirt on the left, this is from a pizza place called John and Vinny's, which is located in the historic Fairfax district in Los Angeles. And it's not a Jewish restaurant. It's not kosher. One of the owners is Jewish, but the use of Hebrew let of faux Hebrew letters here provides a symbolic representation of the restaurant's location in this Jewish neighborhood. And the, the use of faux Hebrew lettering doesn't just indicate Jewishness. In the, the image on the right, this is from a website called 929, which gives texts in Jewish, uh, which gives um, ancient texts with new perspectives. And the use of, this was a designed logo, um, where, which makes use of the faux Hebrew letters, where um, the A is a mem backwards and the G is an upside down pay. And it uses those letters, not just to represent the Jewishness, but to represent the old texts part of this website. Notice new perspectives on the bottom is written in a different font with a sans serif font and uh, not representing Hebrew letters. The next function of script mixing is code. Now, sometimes people want to hide things from people who don't know Hebrew. So they might, you, you could argue that some of those, um, those logos of the, the sports teams and the political candidates and the universities serve a coded function, but this button here serves a coded function in a different way. This says, and I'm gonna use some vulgarities here, it says bullshit. And this button would allow somebody to flaunt, to, um, to uh, avoid the restrictions about using vulgarities. Like let's say this, someone wore this button to school and the vulgarities, you're not allowed to wear vulgarities on, a, on your outfit, but if someone wore this button, most people in the school, if it was not a Jewish school, wouldn't know what it says. The same goes for this shirt. Now, this is a shirt that you would get in um, Israel when you were a teenager on a trip to Israel. And it doesn't make any sense. If you look at the Hebrew letters, it looks like it says Lebu chaschag gechaka pam. It really doesn't make sense. But if you turn upside down, you can see everyone do it. Turn upside down. Okay, you don't have to, but um, but it says go f yourself. Um, it's it's another vulgarity, and and so this is another example where uh, someone could wear it to school and uh, not get in trouble for it. And people used this uh, same technique when designing the shirt for uh, Camp Shomria, which is a progressive Zionist camp in upstate New York, and it says last summer ever. This was a um, 2012 shirt uh, making use of the popular Mayan calendar end of days theme. And you can see the back of the shirt as well. Now you also see the coded function of mixing scripts in this restaurant, which is not far from my house, Mamila. Mamila is a, an uh, upscale 
neighborhood and shopping district outdoor mall in Jerusalem. And the restaurant bills itself as upscale Mediterranean restaurant. It doesn't say anything about being Jewish. It doesn't say anything about being kosher, um, but it has the Hebrew vowels underneath the English letters. And so I would argue that that serves a coded function that people can look at that and say, oh yeah, that is Jewish. And the final function of script mixing is pedagogy. Here we have a textbook for Jewish students using English words with inserted Hebrew words in the text. And this is because the textbook authors want the students to learn how to read words like gvurot and brachot. But you also get this in teaching Hebrew reading to people who do not, who aren't necessarily learning what the words mean, they're just learning how to decode Hebrew. Now this was a curriculum from 1953 for reform students. And you can see one image from inside the book. It, it says, get your popcorn here. There's a new letter, Mark said to himself. I'd better use my Mars scope to see what this is. Now this is, it uses Ashkenazi uh, phonology here, pronunciation. Um, the point of this book was not to teach Hebrew. It was to teach how to read Hebrew so that the students would be able to read the prayers. And this doesn't happen much today. It doesn't happen in an official way like that textbook from the 50s, but you do get this informally in some classrooms. For example, this is from a reform religious school and it was a worksheet that the teacher handed out and it says Shem, name, but the rest of it is in English. It says, I have loved being your Mora, your teacher. I hope you'll practice your prayers over summer. Can you make your own? So this is again, helping the students practice decoding Hebrew. And so again, mixing scripts for pedagogical purposes. But you also get this in strange combinations like this book, this textbook for learning how to read Hebrew where each, it, it's, it's translations of the Psalms into English, but initially they use some Hebrew letters. They look on and stare at me. It's very hard to read. They, you're supposed to learn what each of these Hebrew letters means and they gradually add more and more letters. Oops. And then by the end, the second half of the book is, is written right to left, left, right to left instead of left to right. And it's very hard for me to read it. It says the generations of his offspring. Okay, so you get the point. It's, it's very um, interesting. And, and um, I don't think this is a common linguistic method, but it does exist. And finally, just two more examples here. This is uh, for another pedagogical use of representing English in Hebrew letters. But in this case, it is to teach Yiddish speaking immigrants English. So each English word here is written in Hebrew letters. They say their house is old. And then it has a translation into Yiddish. They zogen, zeh is alt. Uh, and so this is from 1893. You get a similar thing in Ladino. This is a phrase book uh, or a, a book for immigrants in uh, America who are Ladino speakers. And you can see it's written in Rashi script, as it's called. It says, good day, sir. Good evening, madam. Uh, and so this is the same kind of thing. It's, it's for Ladino speakers to learn some English. And it also, it translates it into Yiddish here as well, in addition to being in Espanol on this side. So in conclusion, we see some diversity in reading ability among people in English speaking countries. Some are fluent in Hebrew or Yiddish or Ladino. Others are monolingual in English, but have some knowledge of Hebrew letters and Hebrew words, and others can't read Hebrew letters at all. And this diversity leads to diversity in the use of Hebrew and English scripts in Jewish English. And the Hebrew letters serve as flexible signifiers they bear different social meaning in different contexts. The use of Hebrew in uh, representing the political 
buttons or the sports teams have a very different signification than the pedagogical materials, for example. And finally, the Hebrew alphabet is not the main medium for Jewish English writing as it was for most historical Jewish language varieties like Yiddish, Ladino, Judeo-Arabic, Judeo-Persian, etc. But as we see, it still serves important functions. And I'll just end with this beautiful image by Hillel Smith, who is here with us today. Uh, it says light and it says Hanukkah. And so this is the, the, the letters when they're turned backwards are parts of both languages simultaneously. So thank you Hillel for creating that beautiful image. And with that, I will come back to you. Hello.